Okay, welcome to Transformative Principle, episode 99. I am very honored to have with me today Jessica Kabeen, who's the principal of the Woodson Kindergarten Center. She has been assistant principal, a supervisor of special education, and a special education teacher in Minnesota. In addition to being the principal, she is a facilitator for the Minnesota Principal Academy out of the University of Minnesota in units surrounding literacy, ethical leadership, and RTI. And she's also a presenter for the Minnesota Department of Education in their P3 Principal Leadership Series. And she also has started a blog called The Sunday Principal, and that is the Sunday Principal spelled not like a principal. (laughs) <laughs> no but the other way just to make sure we're clear on that and that's the sunday com. so please check that out now we're going to talk about what it's like being at a kindergarten center and the first thing i want to say is the song popsico is now <laughs> stuck in my head and i didn't even know it existed so it sounds like you guys have a lot of fun at uh, at your school? Oh, oh, Jethro, we we do. I when people, community members, or uh, the state or anybody comes in, I forewarn them that they're entering probably the happiest place in Minnesota, if not in the nation. You just you can't leave without smiling or feeling cared for and encouraged. I I get a lot of feedback even from our substitutes that they just feel like it's just happy and the kids are wonderful and the staff is really uh, owns the whole school and we're just a, a huge family but i think when you work with you know up to 400 five and six year olds it's really hard not to be happy <laughs> yeah absolutely so you did a little video of a of a song called popsico and it was as i watched it this morning with my kids they said "Ooh, that looks like fun and they all wanted to see and watch it <laughs> and they don't know what we do as principals and they have their perception, but they could tell that you were having fun, that your kids were having fun and that there were a lot of smiles on everybody's faces. And even the kids who weren't participating in it just yet, they were engaged in what was going on and, and knew they were in a safe place. And it looked like that on the video. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes, but just, I want to warn everybody that song will be stuck in your head. (laughs) And, uh, <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. So you've got about almost 500 kids in, in the school, right? How does, how does, oh, 400, 400, 400, yep. excuse me. Yep. How does that work with how big is the area that you pull from for the students to come to your school? Oh, yes. We actually are the citywide kindergarten center. So then they, they break off into four elementary schools from, from our location. So, Austin, Minnesota is about a population of about 25,000 people, and we are the home of spam. I'm pretty proud of that because I actually like spam. (laughs) I like to to advertise it when I can. But because of that, uh, not only do we have some of the factories, but we are the international headquarters for Hormel. So we also, we have a wide range of population of families that come to our school. We have business people that are upper tiers of management of Hormel, and then we have the factory workers as well. So that's a huge employer in our community, and it really shapes the students and and the staff in the building too, because we really want to meet the needs of the diverse populations that are walking through our doors every day. Yeah, absolutely. Now, what do you think are the major benefits benefits of having a kindergarten center for the whole district or the whole city. How do you provide things better than they would be provided for at a at a regular elementary school? One of the biggest pieces is consistency and alignment. It is really unique to have 16 classroom teachers that are in the same building working with the same ages of students. We have a curriculum map that we all follow. We have PLC meetings and we're able to connect and talk with each other. But it's also interesting because we are we function our campuses on teams because there are a lot of kindergartners. So we try to do things that are cross team too, because you might get to know the six people on your team really well and collaborate well with them. But we also want to expand our knowledge. And so you might go across the hall or down the hall and get to see somebody else doing something a little differently. We also, with that high concentrated of students, we have some higher rates of support staff that I don't think you'd get at a neighborhood school. Like, um, for example, we have, you know, a a halftime social worker that's pretty dedicated 
between our early childhood center and Woodson. So she's got the pre-K, K knowledge. The same with our social worker. We have three full-time special ed teachers and two full-time English language learner teachers. So that really, those levels of resources are extremely beneficial for our staff too, just to have that sense of understanding specialized populations. We also have what we call a high ability teacher. So he comes in and pushes in and, and helps support our students who are already coming in reading and how do we continue to extend what they're doing and make sure it's enriching experience for them. And then we also have an instructional coach that helps to provide supports for our teachers. So I think one of the biggest pieces is just having all those resources in one campus has been beneficial. And it's also just, and I can talk a little bit more about this, but there I've, I found four key things about working just with kindergartners. And one of those things is really being able to provide staff development that's appropriate for pre-K, K, K, and first grade teachers, because you have to get things a little bit different than, for example, a fourth grade teacher. And sometimes at an elementary setting, you're in staff development as a kindergarten teacher, but you're also in it with first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. And so sometimes curriculum or initiatives or strategies that work great at those upper elementary levels are really challenging or not developmentally appropriate at that K level. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that I do want to hear about these four key things, but I want to ask you questions as we go through them. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that you're going to have great information. You talked about all the extra key support personnel that you have at the school. Is that typical for your district to have a social worker and a high ability teacher? Or is that something that is focused specifically on the kindergarten center? No, we... Each site has those supports, but for example, when they go into elementary schools and you have a quarter of the population, you might not have the percentage of FTE that we have at the kindergarten center. The one unique position that we have at the kindergarten center that we don't have at any other site in the district is we have what we call a behavior interventionist this year. That's a classroom. She was a classroom teacher that had phenomenal behavior management skills and was deeply um, supportive in our PBIS initiatives. And so now she spends time working individually with students and we use the check-in and check-out process, but she collects data. Um, We look at students individually. We identify students through our RTI process that would meet the needs for that intervention. But we really are proactively looking for kids that have had limited school experience. We still have a percentage of students who have never gone to preschool, never set foot in a school. And so we want to try to make sure that we're setting them up on a strong foundation, not only academically, but socially and emotionally. And so having that behavior person here, she's not a reactive. It's not like an in-school suspension. It's not a detention space. It's really capturing kids as they walk in the door and giving them a positive interaction with an adult and saying, I care about you. I'm excited that you're here and let's get your day started off well so we can make a successful transition into the classroom and into learning. Yeah, that's awesome. We did that at the elementary school. I was an assistant principal at before I came to Kodiak and did the same thing. Took a teacher who was really good at behavior support and then put them into that role. And then they did check in and check out. And that was a really successful way to do it. And they had the respect of the teachers because they were a respected teacher to begin with. And then they were able to work with the students to help them be successful. So I love that approach. I think that's really powerful. When you're providing your staff development to your teachers, I can only imagine having everybody have the same needs of who they're teaching. So everybody's individual in the skills they have and how they need to develop. But I imagine that it's just so much better being able to say everybody here is teaching kindergartners and only kindergartners. And that's what we're focused on. What are some of the the benefits of that focused professional development that you've seen so far? Uh, just building off each other and building off our own developmental knowledge. We're in a phase now in our building. It's been a kindergarten center for 11 years now, but we're starting to have some teachers retiring. It's a strong tenured building. We didn't have a lot of turnover until this year when we had some teachers retire. And we're seeing with teachers that are new to the practice, they come into kindergarten and they may have had like a student placement for a couple weeks in a kindergarten classroom, but most of their experience was in fifth grade or They may have had one class on developmental 
you know, in abilities, but really didn't fully understand the impact of it. So bringing those staff members in with some of our seasoned staff or teachers who had pre-K licensure and K licensure, you can really talk through not just the academics, but those developmental needs of having the kids be successful. And then this year, we're really trying to focus more on that flipped PD. And I know Brad Gustafson has talked about that. And we, for example, we just did a staff development on our engineering unit in science. And so we had some of our teachers who are extremely passionate and dedicated about science go ahead and lead some activities on creating ramps and talking about how you create ramps and angles and planes and using high-level vocabulary, but in a developmentally appropriate way, and sharing that resources with teachers who this is their first experience in kindergarten, and they never wanted to get the ramps out because they were afraid the kids would eat them or throw them or do things. And so it's really giving that expertise of, note: we have done these units. They are, they are great for kids, and we can really get those critical thinking skills in five-year-olds, and we can do it in a way that they're going to understand it and be able to apply it in future lessons. So that's been really fun. And so, and next month now we're going to be focusing on our play centers. Each day the kids get 20 minutes in a play center and we have rotating themes. And so next month we're going to really talk about how do we instill some of those critical thinking skills in the different play center activities. So it's just taking some of the context, but then letting us get in there and interact and talk about all the different developmental needs that our kids bring to the table and the language needs and the special education needs and how can we address those. Yeah, that is amazing. I really like that. What's the second key thing that you've seen? One of the pieces that I talk about with the Minnesota Principals Academy and also with the P3 leadership is that as a principal of elementary and especially of kindergarten, we really need to have a solid understanding of those developmental needs of a kindergartner. And I give the example that I was enmeshed in PBIS and grading for learning practices in the middle school. And then three months later, I was doing bus duty and supervising a play center activity in kindergarten. And I'm like, I don't know where the life skills is in this. I'm not sure how this is relating to standard. I was really struggling and trying to figure out how, how this looks in kindergarten. And it was really because of my lack of understanding how milestones in pre-K, K transition. And so really having resources available. So as a leader, because you have to lead these staff members, you evaluate these staff members, but you may have been your whole career in the high school teaching. And so understanding that drawing on those resources, either going through trainings, getting looped into uh, state and national level early childhood organizations has been really helpful for me because I just needed to, to grow my own knowledge of developmental milestones and needs so that I could apply the academic standards to that. And what are some of the ways that you have learned about the developmental mind milestones and possibly how can other principals who are not at a kindergarten center learn about the appropriate developmental milestones for their age group that they are principal of? Become good friends with your preschool collaborative people. (laughs) That has been very helpful because we actually have a preschool classroom right in our center this year. And so being able to get in there and meeting with that teacher, and she is a seasoned teacher and she can explain, well, yep, they're playing with blocks, but we're doing some things around language with this, or these are how I'm integrating, you know, being able to attend and follow directions. We also, I am a member of our you know, principals academy for, or principal elementary school principal, but I'm also a member of the National Association for the Education of Children. It's a pretty reasonable membership annually, and you get tons of great articles, resources, and uh, books throughout the year that are just really easy to be applicable to reading a little bit and then going into classrooms and seeing it in action. So those are just kind of nice ways to um, understand that. But some of the things that I really took, and I've only been doing this for four years, so I have a long journey ahead of me. I think I'll be the longest kindergarten student ever. I don't think I'll ever <laughs> graduate to first grade because there's so much to learn. But um, looking at the schedule specifically was something I really focused on because five and six-year-olds have a hard time transitioning. Mm-hmm. And I think anybody who's ever hung out with a five and six-year-old for more than 20 minutes knows it's hard to, to shift activities, especially from a desired to an undesired. So we really looked at the flow of our building. You know, For example, we always do recess before lunch because it's really important to get the physical activity out, but then we have time to really sit and focus on eating versus eating really quick to get outside. Mm-hmm. The thing about Woodson that I'm really proud of is our school day is a little bit shorter. We go 8.30 to 2.05. 
but then the teachers have their prep time after the students leave, which means that classroom teacher is with the child all day. So we don't have specialists at, at the kindergarten center. The teachers run the play centers. The teachers run the gym activities, and then we run um, smart training stations, brain-based stations, but the teachers facilitate all that. And then we have classroom paraprofessionals that supervise lunch and recess. And that has really decreased behaviors in our building. That, that's that been established before I got there, but I've noticed now after reading some of the research, kiddos just have a really hard time generalizing. This is what I'm supposed to be like when I'm with this teacher in this room, but now I'm supposed to be like this with this teacher in this room. And so not having different specialists coming in uh, has really decreased that anxiety about what's going to be different in the next environment and helps to really develop those critical thinking skills and those um, self-regulation skills when you only have to navigate a few people. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great insight. And now that I look back at how we did things at the elementary school I was at, I can see how we sometimes set the kids up for failure by having too many people involved and how powerful it would be to have fewer transitions and fewer different adults. So that's really cool. What's the, the third thing? I really... Uh, talk about parent engagement and coming again from that middle school where sometimes the kids and the parents, if they saw me out in the community, they turn and run the other way. Yeah. When you work at a kindergarten center, you, I, my husband kills me because sometimes I try to go to the grocery store and we can't leave because you're, you're caught after kid, after kid, after kid, or parent, after parent, after parent, because they're just so excited about what their kids are learning and the kids are so excited to see you. So you really get a lot of, it's an easy win. Parents seem more willing to be a part of the school community at a younger age than I noticed as they got older. So we really capitalized that at the kindergarten center and working with getting parents as partners. But one of the things I noticed too is because I did work at the secondary level, I've already had some of my students at the high school, middle school, high school that are already parents and bringing students in at the kindergarten level. Uh -huh. So kind of understanding, and I think we all do this as administrators, is so when our parents come in as advocates for their children to keep in mind their own school background and what, what they experienced as positive or negative school experiences. And also recognizing that kindergarten today certainly doesn't look like kindergarten when they were kindergartners, nor does it look like when we were in kindergarten either. So it's a lot more education and explain to parents why there might be a little bit more academics or a little bit more focus on certain things because it's just, it's an awareness and it's just, they just didn't know about it because we, we are really exploring and experimenting with kindergarten as we go to. And so trying to find those ways of connecting our parents right away and getting them engaged and exciting about helping their child learn and being a partner with us. So, for example, it seems like worksheets or activities, we get them turned in a lot quicker than maybe third or fourth grade parents. Or, you know, when I'm working with my elementary or secondary colleagues, um, parent engagement is a little bit more challenging. But I think at the younger levels, the materials are a little bit easier for some of our families to understand and do at home and support us with. Uh, we also have really learned that social media is our friend at the kindergarten center. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no longer do we, we send the newsletters home paper copy, but they don't, they don't come back. You can tell people haven't really looked at them, but we started to move to our, our blog, which popsicles on and we put some resources on there for parent training. So, as parents are starting to get ready for kindergarten, we set up these videos that kind of show here's some things that we could really use your help on in getting your child ready for kindergarten. And so we have videos of role playing. How do you read to your child? You know, how can you encourage color identification at the grocery store? How can you encourage conversations in the car? And so we have a, a series of about 20 different videos that parents watch throughout the summer. We pushed them out once a week onto Facebook. And then we did some challenges at the end of the summer where if they turned in their calendar that they saw at least six of the videos, we had some community drawings. Um, so just things like that have been really helpful in getting parents bought into being a partner in education and realizing that we have to, in order for our kids to be ready to be readers by third grade, we need all the time we can get. And sometimes that means um, borrowing some of that time with parents too. Yeah, you know, the how to connect with parents and where we're at now as a as a society and a culture is a much more difficult thing than many of us are ready to accept. And, you know, we just had a meeting with our PTA and they said, you know, we want to be informed more. And every idea that we had about how to connect with parents, I could think of a parent who 
did not have access to that way of connecting. So, you know, we could send a newsletter home, but I know that that parent, a parent doesn't check their mailbox or the kids get there and take things out first. We could text all the parents, but not all parents have cell phones. We can call all the parents, but many parents are at work the whole time school's in session and afterward and work until nine o'clock at night and we could put it on Facebook, but we know that some parents don't have Facebook and you know, every one of these things, there's someone who's not going to be able to get that notification. And so I love what you're doing and, and what you have on your website of these people doing these things and you have a really simple way of presenting it. What are you doing? Watch it. And then what else? So extra Mm -hmm. things for them and what a simple and amazing way to make sure that, that you're getting the kids what they need. I just think that it's a fantastic idea and implemented in a very easy way for parents to get engaged and see what's going on. And then did you have, uh, I think you said in your email that you had celebrity guests. Oh, yes. So tell me more about that. So in starting this work, we really are working with our community because one of the community initiatives is having all children ready for kindergarten. And so we thought, what better way to do that than show that community leaders are wanting to support that and making sure that all our kids are ready. So we asked, um, for example, our former mayor and one of our success coaches in the district to do the role play for card game at the cafeteria. And then we had a different, we had our head librarian from the community library and a different um, Spanish speaking um, soccer coach. One of the head soccer coaches in our community, they did a role play on reading to your child. And so, and then we also um, made sure that every teacher and para in the building were in videos because as we put these out the summer before they went into kindergarten, we thought, well, what a great way for parents and children to see all the different adults that they'll see in the building. So it really kind of helped to build that sense of community. And it was so interesting to see some of these adults that we see as pillars of our community, terrified to get on camera and read. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It gave such a perspective, like you can, you can run our city or, you know, run our library, but getting on camera and reading to another person was, you know, intimidating. So it was very interesting to see that where the classroom teachers were like, turn it on and I am ready to teach right now because they're so passionate about making sure that we're providing uh, very realistic opportunities for parents to be partners and in learning some of those basic skills. And and a lot of times they think, well, they know their ABCs, they're ready for kindergarten, but we really wanted to focus on some of those other abilities to attend, abilities to sit in a chair, abilities to follow directions, abilities to accept a decision. If If you lose at a game, can you recover from that or are you having a tantrum for 20 minutes? Minutes. So mm-hmm. helping parents understand that being ready for kindergarten is not just about knowing your ABCs and your one, two, threes, but to be able to do some of those other social and emotional things are really key. Yeah, absolutely. And who who's doing your video work? Is that something that you're outsourcing or is somebody in-house doing that? How does that work? Uh, we have a district technology integrationist and he he does the district and then he does also work with Woodson. So he's kind of the guy that's helped us um, do the videos and the editing. And then he was instrumental, instrumental in getting our blog up and helping me get that running. Because as much as you already know, it's a little bit harder for me with technology. <laughs> <laughs> You're great. He, he, oh, he was, he's a patient teacher. So it, he's, I appreciate these um, integrationists because what they're doing for even the principals in the district is it's not just, let me just do this for you. It's he sits behind me and shows me, here's how you start a blog. Here's how you start a page. Here's how you do these things. So even kindergarten principals can learn a few new things here and again. So, yeah. And then, so then Jethro, just to let you know too, with those videos, we got such a, a favorite response on those that we're doing online monthly newsletters now. So once a month, we do a less than a 10 minute video and we highlight what's going on next month. So parents know what kind of activities are coming up. We also highlight a place in the building so parents can see what the play centers are. What else is we, we're doing? Oh, math units, what we're going to learn in math. And then we do this thing called kid principal. And it is the funniest thing ever where we bring in six to seven kindergartners and we just ask them some questions about if you're a principal, what would you do? And it, A, it's just hilarious to see what some of these kids are saying. And B, it gets parents to tune in because they want to see if their kid was the kid principal. 
Yeah, that is a that's a powerful way to make things happen. That is for sure. Oh yes, I last this next month that's coming out. It was all about if you could make the rules at at Woodson, what would they be? And I'm gonna write a few of these down, and maybe I'll try to bring them up in future years. Because I'm like, I never really thought about that being a rule, but <laughs> but then again, I'm I'm far from being a five year old, so I kind of lost yeah. that perspective. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, that's fascinating. So, what's the fourth thing? Uh, The fourth thing that I've really learned is to be more knowledgeable about preschool options in our community. I I was aware of the the school district. We have a a pre-K, you know, within our school system, just because my own children went through that. But I wasn't fully aware of all the different preschools we had within our community. So I took some time to go out and visit them and see what the environment was like, meet some of the teachers, meet the directors, and just kind of put a face to a name. So, yep, I'm the kindergarten principal, but I really want to uh, thank you for the work that you're doing and preparing our kids for kindergarten and really honor the work and the and the value that they're they're doing each and every day. And sometimes preschool teachers don't seem to get that that credit because they do have a, a difficult job. And then um, with that, so we established just knowing where everything was. Then uh, we started to create these transition forms from pre-K to K. And it was based upon some work we did as pre-K and kindergarten teachers where we identified Uh, what would make a student ready for kindergarten in the Austin public schools. And then we share that with parents, but then we develop these transition forms to really help us um, know the attributes of the kiddos coming from pre-K to K. And so I would go out this spring and meet with all the preschool teachers and we'd fill out these transition forms together. So I would learn, you know, not just about their academic abilities, but, you know, this student's a little bit shy. And so if we could have them in a class or in the hall with one of these students, it would be really great. Or, this student has had a death in the family and so they're really struggling with loss. And so if you could get the social worker connected with them, that would be great. But again, just getting um, the voice of the preschool teacher, moving it up was really helpful. And then uh, we are a pretty mobile district. We get families coming in and out throughout the course of the year. We've had three already this week, which is not unlike other districts, but chances are if they have a kindergartner, there's probably a younger sibling in that family. And so having that information on hand so I can hand them information about preschools that are available within the community right there at the kindergarten center, there's a higher likelihood that they're going to seek out that preschool versus having to navigate all the different systems within a a community. And for some of our families that don't speak English or are new, it's just such a challenge. So if we can give that information to parents and hope that they can get their children into preschool, it just makes our job so much more exciting as they have that year or two of preschool before they come to kindergarten. You have this turnover naturally because you only have one grade. That seems like an emotional roller coaster. I know what kindergarten teachers are like, and they're the most loving, wonderful people. And they don't even get to see the fruits of their labor, you know, a couple of years later when they're in third grade and they're turning into the kid that they're going to be. Have you noticed that that's a difficult thing or is your community tightly knit enough that they they still see those kids around town and stuff? Oh, it's, it's pretty tightly knit. And we also uh, do transition forms now from kindergarten to first grade. And so those first grade teachers stay in pretty close contact with our kindergarten teachers. So that's been really um, exciting to see the kids grow. It is hard. And now being my fourth year, I'll see kids in the community and, and I have a hard time remembering which year were you at Woodson. I can usually remember remember what critter you were, what class you were in, but what year you came through because they all kind of blend together. But we did a really unique thing last year. We're going to continue it coming up because we had our 10th anniversary last year. And so we coordinated with our high school in which we brought all the current ninth graders that were kindergartners 10 years ago back for a service learning opportunity. And so we matched them with their kindergarten teachers. So if they were somewhere else in the district, we brought them back for the day. Or if they had retired, we brought them back. And so these ninth graders then sat in the same classroom as the current kindergartners and then did activities together, did coloring sheets, uh, the kindergartners. It was the neatest opportunity ever. And it was so much fun to hear from the ninth grade teachers at how respectful and responsible the ninth graders were when they were with those kindergartners. So it's something now when they become seniors, we'll do every year is to bring the senior class back to the 
current kindergarten class to kind of just get a get a sense of this is where I used to be when I was in kindergarten and for the kindergartners this is what I can be when I grow up and the teachers just loved it they love seeing their former students so it is it is powerful to be able to to say I shaped something or I did something even when they were ninth grade a lot of those kids remembered exactly who their teacher was so it's neat they do leave they definitely leave a mark they I hear that from lots of parents that they always remember which critter they were because we go by um, woodland critter so they always remember if they were a bunny or a bee or a gopher or a cricket, they just, they can remember that forever. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, I definitely remember my kindergarten teacher, Mrs. Smith was her name, and she was an older lady with short cropped gray hair and had glasses, kind of like a, you know, what you would think an old kindergarten teacher would be. I don't remember too much about her, but I certainly remember her name, and I remember she did not make me feel like I hated school, so that was, <laughs> that was a good That's- thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's and that's that's the really the most important thing in kindergarten is if you can create and build that love of learning. I mean, you just can't get any better than that. To see the excitement every day when these kids come into school about what they want to do and who they want to be, and if and that's just such a neat feeling to have that you had a little spark in that as they get older. Yeah, that is really cool. I've learned a ton um, already, but I want to talk to you about one more thing, which is you are working with the Principal Academy at the University of Minnesota. And can you talk to me a little bit about what you're doing there and how you're helping principals up there? Yes. Uh, the Principals Academy was is been around for a while in the state of uh, Minnesota, and it's uh, through the National Institute of School Leadership, NISL is the curriculum that they use, but they take cohorts of practicing principals and walk you through a series of units around uh, different areas of leadership. And you're with that cohort for almost two years and you get to really dig into some of that theory, but get to practice it too. And so I was part of a cohort years ago in Rochester. And then uh, about two years ago, they they were seeking new facilitators because they want to continue to grow practicing principles to help spread the knowledge of, of learning about these leadership traits. So I went through a pretty intensive training under Dr. Katie Pacal at the University of Minnesota and NISL. And now I facilitated a couple units. Uh, and then ne- now this next year, I'll be moving into a few more. So it's just really an exciting opportunity to be part of some of the knowledge of the Institute of School Leadership, but then growing with other practicing principals. And it's just, it's two days. uh, The sessions are usually two days at a time. And then every other month you come back, but um, just getting the connections and the learning. And even though I've been through the curriculum um, and I continue to use it, I always gain more going back with other colleagues and other professionals and developing those relationships. Yeah, that sounds like a really neat program. Are the two days for the courses? Are they during school time or are they on the weekends? How does, how does that work? Yep. It's usually during the school days and uh, enrollment, you usually, you do need to get like your superintendent to support it because there's a financial impact to it. But um, once you commit to it, there's, it's usually two days during the year, uh, usually October, December, February, April. And then we have some in the summer too, but um, we really, they, Katie, Dr. Pakel does a wonderful job of making sure that that time is well spent. And so you have time to reflect and do some reading and then come back and do some discussions too. Uh, you do have to commit to the whole uh, schedule of it though. So it's an application process in which you apply to be accepted into it. And then um, from that point, you have to commit, you're going to do it from beginning to end. Cause like I said, it's like a year and a half. Uh, this year, they're actually doing a cohort up in our northern Minnesota area because they had a whole district that wanted their administrators to go through this. So they um, really worked and got a branch up there that we'll be traveling to. Otherwise, they more are centrally located either in the Twin Cities area in Minnesota or uh, Rochester was the one I went through. So it is a a powerful opportunity um, to be able to connect with colleagues. And I've enjoyed that experience, just like the P3 leadership too, being able to sit in a room with 60 other elementary principals that want to learn more about kindergarten. You can't get any better than that, Jethro. (laughs) Yeah, no kidding. That is cool. So you've taught units on literacy, ethical leadership, and RTI. Condense two days worth of stuff into, you know, a minute or two about each one of those. (laughs) Well, and RTI will be something new for me this year. My, my main focus has been principal as an ethical leader. 
And so what that really looks at is, and it's later in the unit. So you've already had a number of units ahead of time where you're really establishing your own vision for your school and um, what you want your school to be like and learning the different tenets around literacy, mathematics, science, uh, the special populations. And so then that principal's an ethical leader really starts to, to talk you through some of those tougher situations and does some role playing and has you look at some scenarios through those different lenses and deciding, you know, you know, do you, how would you handle this situation? So um, it makes you talk in teams about how you might handle something. And then um, it's also time for us to share. And by then, the, the communities are pretty tight knit and you feel pretty safe that you're able to talk through things. But NISL really uses some language around being a just, fair and caring school community. So defining that in your own context and then walking these situations through that context to make sure that you're making decisions that are, are part of your core, but then keeping those NISL uh, parameters around it, too. When we did a kind of a different piece, too, this year is which we, um, with social media being more and more prevalent in our schools, um, you're also seeing parents, um, staff members, and other adults maybe abuse that social media. And sometimes, how do you respond to that? And so we took the staff or the teach the principals through a scenario on how to respond to social media meltdowns or, you know, those, those emails that teachers get. And we talked them through a process of responding to that on a way that they could turn around and then teach that to their teachers. Because sometimes, I mean, I, I'm sure I'm not the only one that has poor teachers come to us because they had a parent send them a, an email in all capital letters and font size 55. And usually uh, by the time I've been involved, there's been four or five back and forth. And so really being able to, to help come up with a process to help respond to that in a way that, again, is just fair and caring, but holds yourself to your core too. Yeah. Can you give an example of how to respond to one of those? Yes. And it's actually, there's a, there's a book and it's called Biff and it's brief informative, friendly, and firm. And so it's four steps in which you get an email and you go through and you, it's a brief. And so it's, I usually try to make it no more than four to five sentences. It's friendly, but it's firm. So I'm thanking them for their information. I'm letting them know this is, this is the decision I'm making. And then it's usually just a very, you know, a sincerely or regards some type of a statement. And then you sign your name. And then it's not a lot of back and forth. And a lot of times we talk about, too, is you make sure you let somebody else read it before you hit send. You find that email friend because sometimes you may think it's brief, friendly, informative, and firm, but somebody else looks at it and says, you know, that's still three pages long. We're going to need to cut this one down. So <laughs> we took our kindergarten teachers through an activity in which the union representative in our building and myself came up with some scenarios of emails that teachers had gotten. But, you know, obviously change the names on things. And then we let them walk through that. And then we saved all those in our share drive. And so as teachers have experiences in the future where they might have that, they can say, oh, I remember that we kind of dealt with this. And so they can go back and see how we had responded to that. So just arming our staff too with not having to take all that on. And sometimes our parents in, in the best, um, they're trying to advocate for their child, but maybe not in the best means. So helping our teachers to understand that they don't have to be responsible for some of that parent behavior. And there's ways that we can support each other in responding to that. Yeah, really, really great idea. I'm definitely going to look up that book and I'll add that to the show notes also so that we can we can share that good information with others. Talk about a little bit about what you're doing with literacy uh, for that Principal Academy. Yes. So um, I'm going to be able to be a part of the literacy unit this year. So I'm really excited about working alongside other practicing principals and how they've used literacy instruction in becoming a principal leadership in literacy. And one of the pieces and offshoot of that that we're going to try this year through the University of Minnesota, but a different category is Press is a, a group that's out of the University of Minnesota. And they are working with Austin to create a pre-KK literacy framework. And so we're going to be taking some time to um, do some observations. The pre-K teachers are going to come to kindergarten and the kindergarten teachers are going to go to pre-K and it's going to count as our peer observation in our teacher appraisal. And then after those observations are concluding in March, we're going to have a half day of a workshop with the University of Minnesota where they're going to come in and give us some of the primary tenets of quality literacy instruction with four, five, and six-year-olds. And then we get to take it and look at it through the lens of the Austin School community. And how can we define key competencies and literacy 
and make sure that those key competencies are spread across our, all of our preschools in the community. So maybe it's a common vocabulary. Maybe it's a common understanding of what we want our kids to be in regards to oral language um, and the importance of that. So um, we're kind of excited to give this a shot and then share that stuff out with the, the Principals Academy too and just really building that P3 transition because sometimes they go from we in preschool in some communities and so it's if we can create some common vocabulary or terminology it's just going to really enhance the foundation of learning for the kiddos and, and hopefully build that as they get up to third grade yeah that sounds really cool definitely a nerdy thing that uh, <laughs> only people who are in education will get excited about but that is really neat i mean taking literacy all the way down to pre-k and then having a plan for continuing that through and then being able to make sure that kids who don't go to preschool still have mm -hmm. what they need. I mean, that that's pretty exciting. So the University of Minnesota, the we, we did a conference call with them in, in the fall because this was very new to them. They're very rooted in the elementary, but the pre-K was something a little bit new. So I remember we did a conference call with our pre-K leadership in the community and myself and the instructional coach. And it was almost like asking someone out to prom Jethro. I had to sell this. I said, you know, we are kindergarten centers. So, you know, you're going to have consistency at K. We have, you know, this many preschools that want to do this. You know, will you, will you go to prom with us? Will you create this work, you know, this workflow or this framework with what you already know uh, with elementary and then um, building on our, our strengths here in our preschools to, to make a framework that's going to be really successful for all kids and hopefully build on it. And if it works, great in Austin. We would sure love to share it with other schools. That, that is so cool. My last question in each podcast is, what can someone start doing this week to become a transformative principal like you are? Oh my gosh. And you told me this one was coming, Jethro, and I'm still caught off guard on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I really think, especially at the kindergarten level, being present with kids and, and that doesn't mean that you have to be doing an activity, and that doesn't mean you have to teach a lesson, but sometimes it's just being present and being around the beautifulness of what five-year-olds are. Um, I was thinking today, I was doing an observation in our play centers, and a student just literally sat on my lap and said, it's time for you to come play with me. <laughs> and I thought, you know what? I guess it is, you know, and just being able to recognize that, that they're only five for a short time in their life and you might be their rock star. And so it might just be putting something down and just being present and being aware of the things that they're learning and then how that you, how you can grow that and how you can help community members understand the importance of growing um, and dreaming big with our littlest learners because they really, they could do anything at this age. And we just need to continue to make sure that we instill that vision for them because as they get older, it gets harder, but when they're five, they can be whatever they want to be. And we can honor that. Yeah. That's, that's great advice, not just for five-year-olds, but I think for anyone, when you have that opportunity to be present with that kid and, and make a real connection, then you got to take it. And I, I appreciate everything that you've taught us. How can people learn more from you? Twitter, website, you know, share all that stuff out. Yes, yes. So my Twitter is at Jessica Cabine. And then my, and I know you already, you already said this, but my, I started a blog, Jethro's getting me to, to grow a little bit in my skills, but it is called the Sunday principle and it's P L E. And one of the things I have learned in this job is this job cannot be my life. And so I switched instead of the principal into the principal because I really feel like my position doesn't define who I am, but I hope that people from the blog or from these other things realize that I'm so working on balance and having regrouping and Sundays are my day for family and reflection and limited social media. So I kind of, that's kind of where my blog came from is just how do I keep that balance and how do I recognize that being a principal is just a small part of who I am, but there's so much more to, to what I have and what I have to offer. So that's kind of why it came that way. But, um, yep, that would be one. And then Packers in Training is our school blog where all those videos are. So that's another resource, too. And I always try to say we're trying to take off the Green Bay Packers, but living in Minnesota, that joke goes nowhere. <laughs> trying to put that in front of a bunch of parents at registration, I got booed. So I learned that yeah. I can't talk about the Green Bay Packers in Minnesota. <laughs> no, that's not worth it at all. So, And and I would love more followers or people to, to let me know what they're doing, too, because I, like I said before, I learned so much from everybody else. And I've just been getting into Twitter uh, and just I'm 
liking so many things. I have just ideas that I wanted. I, like I said, I'll be in kindergarten forever because there's so many things I'm learning every day that I want to keep trying here. So cool. Well, Jessica, thank you so much. I have learned so much from you and I know the oh. listeners will as well. So thank you for your time and, and sharing all your information with me and with my listeners as well. Well, thanks again for the opportunity, Jethro. This is a lot of fun. What an amazing interview from Jessica. She is really fantastic. I've been learning from her for a while now in a Voxer group, and it has really been inspiring to hear what she has to say, and I hope that you enjoyed it. She goes above and beyond in everything that she does. So if you subscribe to the newsletter at transformativeprinciple.org, then I will send you the additional notes that she gave us, and I will also send you a copy of the top five things that I have learned how to be a transformative principal from all the interviews that I've done. So please sign up for the newsletter at transformativeprincipal.org. Transformative Principal is a proud member of the Edu Podcast Network. If you want to learn something new, check out Jennifer Gonzalez's Cult of Pedagogy podcast. She's got a great website with beautiful design and produces really great content all the time. Mm-hmm.